Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to talk about the pitfalls of a poorly executed access review, as well as the consequences associated with that. Um, so today we have Paul Horn, who's the founder and CEO of H2 Cyber, Paul Feather, who's in charge of CompuNetics, and Garrett Grajak, who's the CEO over at UATest. Also joining us today will be Kasha. He's our senior sales engineer, and he's going to go live into what UATest looks like and what an actual access review looks like. Yeah, let me interject here, uh, team. Thanks for joining, and I see people uh, joining right now. We are going to have some excellent materials around identity governance and specifically identity access reviews, which we've known, and Ashley and I personally, from getting out a bunch of out back after COVID and ISIS shows and Isaacca shows. What we see people say to us is, you're right. You're right, Ashley. You're right, UATS. We got us. We, we should be doing our user access reviews. But there's a sense of how do we get to start? That's why today's webinar is so important and the offer at the end. We've got worldwide com uh, compliance and cyber expert. Paul Feather is 100% compliance. He's going to help us guide you on what you should be in compliance. But on the other side of the coin, very importantly, and just as a point of not, is Paul Horn, who can help you understand how this relates to your cybersecurity practice. So we are going to give you this information and that hopefully you know, ruffle a few feathers around your practices, et cetera, but then tied together in a nice package of how we can immediately start addressing your identity and identity governance concerns. Take it away, Ashley. All right. Thank you. So the agenda for today, I've already gone over the introductions. We're going to talk about how the industry is today, what state it's in. We're also going to talk about how are access reviews being done today? Where should you start? This is the biggest question that we hear from prospects is it's super overwhelming. I don't even know where to start. So we're going to help you with that. How are we going to help you? With you a test. We're going to go into a demo. Um, so that will show you exactly how this works and how it can help your organization. Then we have our special offer, which is called Get Your IGA Program Started. I'm going to talk about that towards the end. And then, of course, we're going to take your questions at the very end. I'm going to pass it over now to Paul Feather, and he's going to talk about what we've seen in the industry. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's been a, a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's very interesting that this conversation we're having this morning is all about what I've seen through compliance and assessments in industry. I want to give you just a couple of assess, uh, situations that we've seen in person regarding user access reviews and the activities within these companies. The first situation was a, a pretty good size oil and gas distribution company. They had five locations, 5,000 employees, and they had a really problem with user access, too much access performed by a single user. That particular user had the ability to do things that they shouldn't be able to do within a couple of their highly risk, uh, risky environment. That particular user actually uh, created a situation that caused the company to actually have to file for bankruptcy. So when that company went offline, 5,000 people lost their jobs, and it was a pretty disastrous type situation. That sounds a little excessive, but even in smaller companies, I've seen within a public company, they had 20 locations, 500 plus employees. Uh, their external audit had to perform these audits and assessments at least annually. And one of the big uh, situations they had or problem they had was with their elevated access. And since we had multiple ERPs in multiple locations, those particular ERPs were not uh, being reviewed across each of the divisions and multiple individuals would have in elevated access or improper access within those ERPs. So the external auditor, they uh, determined that they had these five material weaknesses. Those are the worst kind of uh, findings that an external auditor can have. Uh, they usually come up with significant deficiencies, and then those get combined over the different divisions within the parent company and cause those material weaknesses. So we were uh, inside on that company trying to help them get uh, remediated. 
Uh, and during that time between the material weakness was published because it is a part of their uh, private, you know, public equity kind of uh, SEC filings, those material weaknesses caused the stock to actually drop pretty significantly until it was remediated. The company stock started to come back up uh, it usually takes about a year or so for that to happen. So from that particular um, user access failure or improper access uh, caused that stock to go down pretty significantly. So the other company that I wanted to speak about is just a very small 200 users. Uh, their access rights were pretty much all over the place, not only in Active Directory and cloud access, but access to uh, ERP that they had, and none of the access was consistent across those ERPs. So when you have a users, 200 users, you have to have a, people to review it, and that was not a very good process. I was an internal auditor trying to help them get better with uh, this problem that they had. The problem was a $20 million misstatement of revenue because of users' access, actually in this case, to a specific relevant spreadsheet that they had within the company. Um, that revenue misstatement took uh, probably two or three years to actually overcome. Um, it was not something that was gonna just kind of go away. They had to actually restate previous years periods. So it was uh, a significant uh, headache. Um, they did come around eventually and have to do a complete, like we're talking about a complete uh, proper in-depth user access review. Okay, Ashley, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is really the whole gist of the reasons why those things uh, came about with those in, within those companies. Uh, if they are being performed at all, they're usually being performed by the wrong people. So I think uh, in most cases, you'll have the IT guys performing these user access reviews and they really don't know who should have the proper access within the particular ERP or files and folders or where it might be just the wrong people performing those access reviews. The other part of it that we always hear is that management does not have the time to actually perform this access review. This is on top of their day job and their day job is taking a lot of their time and the user access review becomes a secondary or afterthought, and they're not performing them uh, timely. That's the other problem. They have these, sometimes it takes them two or three months to finish the actual access review. Um, these applications that we're speaking of today, we're gonna talk about Active Directory and Azure AD and some other things, but primarily these companies have applications that are isolated. They're not consistent user IDs across those applications and causes uh, misidentification of users, inability to actually see uh, specific users across all those apps. And we call those siloed apps. So I, I think from a past experience, it's really imperative that you have uh, a process or a procedure to help you get to that compliant state with user access reviews. And truly, that's what we're here for today is to tell you a little bit about how to get that process better. Next, please. Thank you, Paul. So now we're gonna switch over to Paul Horn and he's gonna talk about how our access review is being done today. Hello, everybody. So um, again, my name is Paul Horn. So what do I generally see in the security world of how access reviews are currently being done today? Now you just heard the compliance uh, side of the house. Now I'm gonna talk more from the security side of the house. What I most commonly come across is if an access review is done, to Paul's point, it's normally being done via Excel. Now, the one thing about Excel is there's no auditing or logging of the Excel, who's modified the document, the, the, you know, the tracking. It's not like a Word document where you can put it in revision, maintain all the history and every, everything like that. And then that's normally followed up by multiple Excel documents being emailed around uh, to various people to have them opine or look or attest or do whatever. And that generally results in errors. Hence the four plus two equals five. 
But more importantly, it's very time consuming and it's a very frustrating process, not only for the person that's performing and trying to oversee the review process, but also from the standpoint of actually completing the review on the reviewer side of the house. But most importantly, from a security side, when access reviews are being done like this today and there are errors, that generally results in an account that's enabled where in reality it shouldn't be enabled. Now, if I'm a, a cyber criminal, one of the things that I'm going to look for is accounts that are maybe disabled, that aren't actually deleted and re-enabling one of those accounts, or taking advantage of somebody that has access that probably shouldn't have the levels of access that they actually truly need. So that's very important from a, from a security standpoint is in most cases, access, access reviews aren't done accurately and people generally uh, at the end of an access review, you find people that have access that really shouldn't have that particular level of access because there's really two things from an access standpoint. There's the individual user's access and the level they have but then also the role, if, some, if the organization's using role-based access control and they assign a role, let's just say they have a role for sales. Well, and there's 12 people that they assign this sales role to. Well, maybe the sales role has access to a folder that they shouldn't have access to. And that's what I mean by the role view. So there's the individual user role level, and then the obviously the role-based access level if, if it's based off of a particular role. Uh, that's beyond the end, the user. Um, Ashley, next slide. So how are they done today? Uh, very haphazardly. You know, there's not a, uh, not a real cohesive process to it. It's sending a lot of different spreadsheets around and then getting the spreadsheets back and compiling them in, putting them together. And that's, like I said, that's just where errors normally occur. And then the quality decreases from that standpoint. Um, not all applications are assessed. Now, obviously, if you have nothing today and you're not doing them today, uh, you're not gonna go out of the gate and just do every application that you have. Uh, there is a very uh, thoughtful process that needs to occur before that uh, happens. And then uh, just the, you know, again, the, the no detailed review, uh, this goes back to just the quality and, you know, anything that's done manually is prone to error. And that's what I like about the UOTest platform is there's a lot of automation that's built into it to take the user out of the equation. Um, and then shared accounts, you know, proper access roles. So uh, just like my sales uh, example, making sure people have, making sure roles have the appropriate access in addition to the individuals having the appropriate access. Uh, next slide, Ashley. So where should you start? As Ashley, as Ashley indicated, this is one of the most common things that we get. You know, where do, where do you really start? Uh, next slide, Ashley. So I like to refer to this as how are you going to eat the access review elephant? Well, the most logical point or, or place to start is really looking at your internal business continuity or disaster recovery plan. And in most cases, if you have a very good BCP slash DR, they could be separate policies. Maybe it's one policy in your, in your organization. But in most cases, you will have identified critical assets to your business because you're going to need them from a disaster recovery and business continuity standpoint to continue running your business. So those critical applications is probably where I would start because your business is dependent upon them. Now, in some cases, they might actually be using the same authentication behind the scenes, but knowing what systems are your most critical systems and having that initial list is a great place to start and figure out what you wanna do and where you should move inward and outward from. Let's just say you have five critical, five high, five medium and five low. Well, you're gonna start most likely with the five critical when you have those all done and your maturity is good, you're gonna expand out to maybe the high systems. When the high systems are done in conjunction with the critical, you're going to bake in the medium and then just and, and just go uh, outward uh, from that sense. But most people will um, uh, start with Active Directory. 
Um, in most cases, people are using Active Directory as essential means for authentication for uh, different apps. Uh, so, you know, like single sign-on and things of that matter. So that's, in most cases, that's really the best place to start is Active Directory, but you still need to look at that business continuity disaster recovery plan, see what those critical assets are. So if those five initial critical, if three of them are using Active Directory for authentication, well, then you just, you, you have three of those already done because they're using the same level of access. And then it's just a matter of bringing in the scope, the other two applications. So that's how you eat the elephant. There's no way possible for you to start out and just start doing all applications out of the gate. It's not going to happen. You have to really start with the most logical path because you do have, while you attest is automated and everything, you still have to educate your internal audience of, hey, this is, we're moving to this product and this is how it's going to look. This is what you're going to get. When you log in, this is what we're going to need you to do. So there is some type of onboarding education that's going to be needed to the individuals that are actually going to be the ones responsible and actually doing the attestations for the end users. Uh, but it's nothing like doing it from a manual uh, process standpoint. Because um, uh, I know somebody had a question related to, um, their question was, uh, actually it disappeared. Oh, it was answered. Um, yeah, it's just, how, how do you, how do you train those people? And, and you attest does good, do a good job of actually educating the audience on, Hey, this is how, how you will do it going forward when you use the UATest platform. Thank you, Paul. So now we're going to pass it over to Garrett and he's going to talk about UATest and access reviews and give a general overview. And first of all, thanks, Paul and Paul. That was great intros into, you know, basically the solution. But I'm going to go back, and we're going to summarize this at the end. The biggest deer in headlights moment always is in the Ashley Garrett Roadshow. When we go out to these shows and we're talking to people, they're like, you're right. Look at these bullet points here. There is no CISO, no CTO no uh, risk manager compliance who doesn't agree in this. There is no argument this should be done. But as Paul summarized at the end in a great way, Paul Horn, how where to start. And that's where we'll go right at the end of this, okay? And I will say of these bullet points, and, and you can read them, we always make your things available. The most important one here is a standard consistent dashboard. Humans are good with consistency. I've got kids. I know once you have no consistency, you have anarchy. The haphazard approach, and that was another bullet point Paul Horn had, the haphazard approach to access reviews is one of the reasons why the hackers are winning against us in identity. We don't have consistent approaches to these access reviews. Next slide. That's why we built this. To be blunt, to be when we built this product, what I did is put gentlemen like Paul Horn on one side. I had a, a, a cyber expert. And then on the other side, I had a compliance expert. And I said, what is the dialogue between you two when you're doing these compliance reports and what needs to be done? What can I automate? And then I had some of the Kashif's friends on the phone as well, and they helped us code this and put this together. So what we delivered was a dashboard, a dashboard to quantify the access review process. And yeah, it's got great features. I mean, you know, features we'll talk about here, features Kashif will go through in the demo and features that hopefully I get one-on-one. -on -one. It's got the dashboard. It's got the... Uh, multiple reviewers. It's got one of the most important features, the auto delegation. What did Paul Feather and Paul Horn start with? Access reviews today is a being them wrong. You've got someone doing a review. He's an IT, he's an Azure AD, he's an AD, he's an Okta admin, and he's saying who should have access? He doesn't know who should have access. He knows how that person should get access. He should get access via a SAML dialogue to the salesforce.com. He should get access to the Workday via an OIDC. That's what he knows. He knows how. He doesn't know who. Who knows is the person at the first line managers. 
And that's where you a test comes into play by pushing out these access reviews to the right people. Okay, next. Automation. Automation is key. We all know humans make errors. And we don't make errors because we want to make errors. We make errors because we're doing a lot. And let's uh, be blunt with the R word. Recession means no one's getting an extra staff. We've got to be more efficient with our staff. And the other thing, I, when we go in the Ashton Garrett, go into these projects and we talk to people, they're burnt out. The people, someone says, let's have an access review. Great. Who does that mean? That means Bob or Ann is supposed to say, fine, I'm going to look up all the users, get the spreadsheets and start sending these out. Yes, they make errors. They make errors because the process is bad. That's why they make errors. So let me leave one more thing before I get Kashif to do a wonderful demo on, we'll probably use Azure AD for the demo, just to, to, but think, think whatever identity store record that not just you help identify, but when we bring the Pauls into your site, they help identify. Next. Not only is this gonna make you more secure, but the cost saving is real. Because of the inefficiencies of the process of manual access reviews, there is tons of cost savings that can be done. And we've, we've actually hired a CPA to talk to our customers and some prospects and some other risk managers. And we went through, and the cost saving is usually around 80%. There is so much wasted time in these manual access reviews. Okay, gosh, if we're live, let's light this candle. Let's show an access review, like a uh, Azure AD SOX type access review. All right. Thanks, Garrett. Hello, everyone. Just let me go ahead and share my screen real quick just to show you the product. And here we go. Garrett, please let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, we see it. Great. So this is the dashboard uh, Garrett was uh, talking about. This is the product, one view for all your audits, all your campaigns that you're going to be running for the attestation of uh, user IDs, attestation of uh, the access. Uh, people will have within your organization. Uh, this tenant of mine is, uh, for this demo, has been integrated with uh, Azure AD, uh, which is my identity store of record in this case. And just to show you how easy the process is, briefly, all you need to do is go to the API section and add these three pieces of information, which you're going to get from your Azure tenant. And then when you are when you're registering a new application that is you attest. So the tenant will provide you these pieces of information, the tenant ID, the client ID, and the client secret. Once you punch in these pieces, uh, it's just a matter of you know a couple of minutes. It will be integrated and you will be able to fetch the real-time data users and groups and application data from your Azure tenant, which I'm going to show you uh, shortly. So this is the basic integration, but if you want to enable your single sign-on, we have a SAML connector built into it. And once you enable that, it will enable the single sign-on. You don't have to uh, put in your credentials separately for Azure and for your test, and it will work perfectly fine, syncing with each other. So when you go to the dashboard, now this tenant has been integrated. Now, let me show you how you can run, for example, for SOX, you can run an application audit to see how many users have access to a certain app that you have uh, within your uh, identity store. For that, you create an audit, select the tenant, which is your Azure AD in this case, and give it a friendly name, uh, for example, K3, for you can remember easily. And most importantly, you need to select a target date by which you would like your uh, reviewers and your managers to complete the audit. Uh, so the timeline is there. Once you click next, it's going to fetch all the information from your Azure tenant and display it on your application audit listings page right here by the name K3. And it will show you briefly how many unique users are there or part of that campaign. And once you go inside, that's where you see the real information that is uh, coming from your Azure tenant. 
Here, it, show, it shows you the application, the target app that you have selected, for example, Finance One, or you could have SAP, you could have Salesforce, and you would like to see who are these members and what level of access do they have to this application. So Ashley, uh, there is an email associated with the user. Uh, if there is any application role will be displayed here, will be fetched by the tool. Who is the manager she's reporting to? Their email addresses will be uh, populated against each profile, uh, the job title, their status, active or inactive. Now, having these, uh, it, these pieces of information, the bunch of information is here, you can easily perform the basic three functions that are part of any attestation process. One, if you're agreeing with what they have, they should have it. You can certify their role. They can, you can certify their access to that particular application. If not, you can go ahead and revoke their access if you don't agree. But if neither of these two are uh, going to be done by you as a risk manager or as the admin of the tool, you can go ahead and delegate it to the person that you think best fits for this role. And he can or she can attest uh, for these individuals in the campaign. Now, when it comes to delegation, there are two uh, options here. One is a single click uh, uh, option where you just you know, go to auto delegate. What it does, you're seeing the manager's information, their email ID over here against every user. What auto delegate does, it picks hey, it let up. Let me jump in there, Kashif. That go is ahead, the big feature that, that saves everyone just tons of time. We had one, there was an international 29 countries, 1900 uh, managers. Okay, who the heck yeah. wants to send out those spreadsheets? And the errors involved there that uh, uh, Paul Horn talked about, that's where the errors come in. Is the right person reviewing? Because he's got a day job and if he's got the wrong guy, he's like, sure, I'll certify it. What do I know? But this automates the process. Thanks. Absolutely. So the auto delegate picks up this information and starts pushing out emails to those individual managers to let them know that there is an audit they have to participate in, click on the link. And when they do, they see the same page, the same campaign, but the difference will be as a manager, they'll only be able to see the users that have been assigned to them, unlike an admin who can see everything uh, within the campaign. So once they have these users and they have opened up the audit, they can perform the same three actions. They can certify if they agree, they can revoke, or they can further delegate it out to more people down the line just to make it you know, uh, distributed evenly if the number is overwhelming. So you know, this is the reviewer part. Now when they, I'll, I'll just show you uh, just for uh, this demo, what information gets displayed when you select an action. I just go ahead and certify the first user here. I'm gonna show you what information it displays so that you can show it to your auditors as well. So here we go on the subsequent columns, you will see it has been, this user has been certified. By whom? The name displays here right next to it, but most importantly, the timestamp is there when exactly that action was taken by this person. And it shows you the overall progress as well. Now, you can do that uh, with all the other uh, individuals, all the other users included in the campaign by bulk selecting all of them from here. And if you want to do a single action, certify or revoke, you can do that. Now, please remember what I'm doing here is just a worksheet. So if I go ahead and select all of them and certify, it's going to display the information that everybody has been certified by this person, but it's not going to automatically execute these actions within your uh, Azure tenant until you go back to your listings page and upon 100% completion of the audit by the risk manager and by the reviewers both, it will show you that it has been 100% completed under the, under the progress bar. And this small uh, icon uh, will pop up, will get, you know, become clickable. That says execute. Only when you press this option, when this press this button, it's going to ask you, do you want to really execute this within your Azure instance? Once you say yes, everything that you have done in there will be auto executed. Uh, so that is one option. But if your IT managers, they have reservations, they don't want to do the auto execute, especially in case of revocations, they can always, instead of going to the auto execute, they can download the report in the form of a PDF, Excel, CSV, and hand it over to their IT admin 
to you know take care of those executions manually. So that and let me safety. just start that. That is your evidence right there. That's the evidence that gets uploaded. Whatever tool and we love all the all the all the compliance tools, whether it's a draw, an audit board, etc. It's just asking that controls asking you for the evidence of your access review, and that's what we produce in this product. Hey, Garrett, if you wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind uh, wanting to piggyback on. No, our, by all means. Both, both you and Cautious were just talking about. Yeah. So from my opinion, from the security side of the house, what I think uh, that's valuable in here that might not be illustrated or visible in here for you, most people's identity and access review program, you might set it up where it's something that's done quarterly. Let's just say your program says, we're going to do quarterly access reviews. That means... There's going to be four of them for the year. So every three months, you're going to do one. So month one, we did one. Month two, we didn't. Month three, we didn't. But the tool inside the tool here, you have the ability to just see what's changed. We don't need to do the whole certification process in month two or month three. You can actually just see the net new users who was added and who was removed from the prior sampling, um, which is a great feature to be able to keep up and on track. So the next month, month four, when you have to go back to certification and going through and doing the access review, you know, you can kind of have an idea of where you're going to be after you start maturing your program. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. And, and yes, you can also, uh, you know, schedule these campaigns if you have to run them regularly on at a set frequency. You can set the frequency from the scheduling table here. You can run it monthly, uh, quarterly, whatever you want, any day you want. And you can set the time up as well. And you can also create a campaign out of this and assign it automatically to uh, anyone you select from here. So yes, this, is, this makes the job very easy for a risk manager to, uh, you know, if they want to remember everything that is going on and then every quarter they have to run the same kind of audit again. So scheduling really helps there. So this is the report uh, that, that is gonna come out um, at the end of the process. If you want it neat and clean, just to present it to your internal and uh, external auditors, the PDF is the best format to uh, have that in. But if you need for the slicing and dicing of the data, just to make it uh, you know, uh, presentable to your uh, internal audience, you can have it in CSV format as well. So it's up to you. Now, um, this wait, was wait for- a second, uh, Kashif. Sure. Uh Let's wrap up. We'll show more later. I want to get to questions and all that because there's some that came in. But real quick, before we have you removed off, and I interrupt Kasha for a living. So, and sorry, uh, can you show where the um, uh, the siloed apps, how we it would pump in? Like the identity store record, the pulse have gone out. They have gone out. They've done their job. They said, hey, guys, start with your Azure ID. Let's get your groups. And then this, uh, this gentleman, like uh, the one who was asked right here, um, uh, Freddie says, yeah, rock and roll, guys, but not all my data is in Azure AD. I've got some information over in AWS. So talk about siloed apps and how this product works. Sure. So uh, every organization, almost every organization, they have certain applications that are not connected to your identity store, your central identity store. So how do you audit those? Because they're not syncing in. So we have a CSV module for those clients who have those siloed apps and they still want to uh, go ahead and do the attestation for those users who have access to those applications. All they have to do is get the data, the users, the groups uh, onto a CSV file. And once they upload this file over here by going to the CSV uh, audit portion, let me show you how and show you where the real magic is happening in this case. Let's say, select the date as usual and choose that CSV file that you have downloaded from uh, that siloed application. Once it's here, click next. And on the next page, you will see all the mapping fields. This is from your CSV file that you're gonna map with what we have on your test site. Once the mapping is done, the roles are there. If there are multiple roles, the tool will pick those up individually and let you, you know, do the attestation for each one of them. Once you have that, you can just create the audit, uh, click the next button and it will show up on your CSV audit list here. For example, it was the finance app. These are 
all the information pieces you had on your uh, CSV file. And the essentially the functionality is the same. You can again certify, revoke, and delegate. But in this case, there is a there is uh, an additional feature. Even though your application is is it's in its own silo, it's not connected to your identity store. But we provide some some automation there as well, where you'll be able to fetch the most recent data from your identity store. For example, what's the current status of this user ID within your identity store? It could be still, maybe the user has left like a year ago, but it's still there in the, in the siloed app, whether it exists on the other side as well. Well, that's, you know, that will fetch that information. Plus you can also fetch the information if the manager has changed recently for any, any identity that is there uh, on your CSV file. So once you have these two pieces of information embedded into the CSV data here, after that, you can do the auto delegate. You can delegate it out to individuals uh, based on the recent information and do the delegation, revocation, and certify the users uh, as needed. So um, at the end of this, when you go to the listings page, you can email this report out to anyone within the organization uh, with all the users, just the certified users, or if you just want to uh, hand over the report with the revoke users to your IT admin, you can do that as well, again, in CSV or PDF format. So that's that's about the siloed app, but one feature- yeah, And that... we can give more overview in depth and show you how it works in your environment and et cetera. But we definitely, I love it at Kashif that you're able to just jump in there and, and uh, show a little bit for the teams. Team, just to let you know, functional product, we take great pride in it, customers, referrals, the whole nine yards or so. This works and we exist for the risk manager. For the risk manager, your problem is our problem. That's why Ashley schedules uh, quarterly reviews with our customers and we take their inputs and the product gets better with every release. So why don't we uh, continue from there? Great job, Kashif. Pleasure. Perfect, thank you, Kashif. All right, let's have some more fun. Um, so we're offering a new program. So as far as next steps, Let's get started. So we're offering an identity discovery assessment. So what does this encompass? So it encompasses H2 Cyber, which is a cybersecurity component, Compunetics, which is the compliance component, and UATS, which automates everything. So the focus of this is cybersecurity and compliance for enterprise identity. So what does this mean? What are we gonna do? We're gonna do the identity discovery so we're gonna identify the key system of record. We're gonna obtain initial user account information. So this will be performed by both the Pauls. We're gonna perform the initial analysis of user account information. So this encompasses a user access review by UATES, which is a one month license upon, based upon that information from that identity discovery. We're also gonna do access review training for the actual risk manager. So the deliverable in this, we will give you an executive summary report, an access review report, as well as recommendations for future reviews. So the cost, so we're very transparent. It's all bundled into one one-time fee of $10,000. And then if you sign up today, I think everyone enjoys a glass of wine at night after a long day of work. You will get a free bottle of wine from Homewood Winery. So this is a great way to celebrate your IGA kickoff and we want to treat you with that. Yeah, and sign up today means just sign up for a meeting. Just uh, ping us at info at uatest.com and then we'll schedule an appointment and uh, rock and roll. Perfect. Should we take some questions? Absolutely. Okay. Um, for both the Pauls, what are usually the obstacles to getting a real IGA program in place? I'll take, I'll take that one. So usually the obstacle is just getting started. It's truly a, uh, a stumbling block because they know they've got difficult getting to the data, difficulty actually getting it started, meaning who's the right person to kick this off? Who's the responsible party for it? 
how is it being uh, covered within the senior leadership and to what level they need to do the access review. So I think, you know, when you get those kind of questions, they know they need to do it, but truly the stumbling block is we know we have problems. The more we know we have problems, we don't really want to get started. Uh, but I, I think once they finally see the actual activity, they understand that they are getting better. And all of my clients from a compliance perspective or assessment perspectives, once they see they're getting better, they tend to be more comfortable and actually moving forward and getting things, uh, as we say, in a compliant state. What do you think, Paul? I, I would echo everything you said. Well done. All right. Perfect. Thank you. I'm just going to check this. I'm going to direct this to Garrett. So for SOX, external auditors and regulators acquire reviewers who document what they actually did to validate or deny access for each user. So what criteria was used to validate or cancel users access? So how does you attest accommodate this requirement? Yeah. Um, first of all, in the in our access reviews that are connected to the identity stories record, we have the uh, uh, deny access uh, built in, which is they can uh, they, the reviewers can once uh, completed with the submit and it's approved um, can revoke the access. We also have in the product the ability to do access requests. Okay, access request certifications. Whereas um, if a user asks. Um, to, for a or a manager asks for an employee to get access to an application, we can document and enact an access request. So why don't we uh, set up a, a time with us, ping us at info at uattest.com, and I'll get uh, uh, Kashif to show you and walk you through. Perfect. Thanks, Garrett. All right, Mr. Feather, who in the organization should start your IGA program? Usually it starts uh, at the IT guy, which is a real burden for those guys. Um, I, I'd say a CTO or a CIO. Uh, most smaller companies don't have that level of uh, activity. So usually your IT guy will be tasked with this process. And that's really just to get it started, but he's not the proper person to actually do the review. So in my opinion, I think that uh, it usually gets thrown onto that IT guy. And I've been an IT guy for many, many years and had that responsibility to actually force that to happen. And it's really not his responsibility, but he is the first guy, first guy to get it and to get it started. Um, there is some risk related activities that are assigned to senior management that they have to, depending on the regulatory requirements, such as SOX, it would be your CFO or your CIO in support of the CFO that uh, are responsible for actually getting it done periodically and properly. Perfect. Mr. Horn, as yes. a risk manager in the company, how much access should I be able to ask from the IT group? So let's just say we're an Azure AD shop. Yeah, well, that's a tricky question. So you should always be able to ask for access to do your job. All companies should practice a least privilege approach, meaning what's the least amount of access I need to do my job. However, you can always submit an access request for access as long as there's an appropriate business justification of why you need such access and it's documented. Um, so that would be my answer. It's a, it's a tricky question only because every company is different in how they structure and set up the least privileged aspect of it and knowing what minimum rights I should have. That really goes down to roles. If people are using a role-based access control uh, approach where you have different roles instead of giving individual users certain levels of access, you grant the roles the level of access and a role is assigned to an individual. And I have to add, that's the fun part of you attest because it quantifies that process. The role is then part of the product. So what it does for the risk manager is gives them that access without having to do that Oliver twist, keep begging, keep begging, big begging. It gets quantified. You use the tool, use the US tool to review, to do your day job, right? And it's a one-time agreement on what access rights you have through the UATS product, be it read or write or revoke, et cetera. Yes. Agreed in all, 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 all manners. Nice. Perfect. Garrett, you're going to love this question. This is your favorite thing. 
What integrations does UATS support for identity? Yeah, rock and roll. Um, Kashif was uh, awesome in his demos because what he did is he, sh he showed it in any 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 application, any data source. Now we got these really quick connectors in um, Azure AD, in Okta, in Jump Cloud. Uh, Ping One's uh, is is in the works. Um, and we also have this amazing PowerShell script. We can do any uh, active uh, directory on premise as well. But what's really important is, is the tool is being used and by people who love the automation. They love the dashboard. They love pushing out the automated reviews. They like the single report. They like that single pane of glass for the project. And they can import any data source via CSV. And in August 1st, which we're lining up API coders as we speak, our full APIs come out. And so anything that you can possibly think of um, can be integrated into this wonderful platform. Paul Square, question for either Paul. Okay. So let's say I'm the risk manager. So after I do the, a user access review, who in the company should be responsible for the changes? Yeah. For the, oh, go ahead, Paul. I was just going to say, yeah, that's the whole point is uh, we were talking about elevated access or privileged access. That type of access is required to make the changes within the applications usually. So there's either an application owner or it could very well be an IT person that has that level of access that can make those changes. But even those changes are tracked within the system of record when they're making those changes. So it's important that your risk manager is going to want to make sure that those changes are being tracked and that they're being documented. They can be done within the platform. The platform will actually track those changes. But if it's being done manually, that could also be a good reason to keep that PDF report for the changes required. And that could be connected to an actual ticket within their ticketing system or help desk ticketing system. So they could say, here is our uh, results of our access review. Here's the changes that are required. And then they can, you know, who actually did those changes from the ticket and that ticket can be uh, tied to that PDF. So very important. Do you have anything to add to that, Paul? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, like Kashif showed in the uh, demo, there is the ability to execute, to actually take the action to, let's say there's three people that have access that they shouldn't have access and you execute that, it takes that access away. So in theory, the person that's doing the access review is the data owner. There's a big difference between data owner and data custodian. IT is typically the data custodian. They're not the owner of the data. The data is, the owner is generally the business person that's, that owns and is responsible for that application. And that person might be the one that's in charge of that entire campaign. And if they hit the execute, they should remove the people that no longer need it. Again, IT is, is more of a custodian. They, they're just managing the system on behalf of the business. Great. Okay, I'd like to wrap this up um, so everyone can get back to their day jobs. I first off want to thank my team as well as the two Pauls for attending today, as well as the, the audience. I really appreciate everyone coming. Um, so again, we have H2 Cyber, who is a cybersecurity expert. We have Compunetics, who's the compliance experts. And then we have UATest, who provides the automation tool. Um, our phone number is right here as well as our email address and our website. So feel free to contact us if you have any questions or to schedule a demo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashley. Great job. Great job, team. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.